thanks very much for those nice introductions. <clears throat> Max Anderson, who was indeed a student of mine at Dartmouth, my first teaching job. And uh, I only realized many years later, or well, had forgotten to remember, that uh, while we were at Dartmouth there in the late 60s, early 70s, Bob Indiana was one of the many young up and coming artists who was invited to visit as a, uh, a visiting artist for term. Uh, and we had many, it turns out, the most exciting artists uh, later recognized uh, as really important, including uh, Indiana, Frank Stella, Rauschenberg, uh, a whole variety of artists uh, kept coming to campus, which um, uh, was really intriguing. And, and it had, as you can imagine, an enormous impact on, on, on st students in the program. And it was there that I first saw uh, uh, Indiana's prints. And usually the idea was, particularly with an artist working on paper or a painter, uh, to have some project during the 12 week period they were there. Usually most of them worked on a print that would then get produced so the students could see literally how major artists were working and what they might be producing at the time. And I guess in retrospect, that was my first sort of um, introduction to pop, uh, which became a, a, a sort of a, a long uh, subliminal interest. And so all these many years later, when I myself moved from 19th century work, still had a hand in it, but uh, to work on, uh, on the pop movement, I, I remembered uh, meeting Indiana, uh, and of course at this point, that is to say in the mid to late 90s, uh, he was beginning to get uh, uh, re-exhibited in New York, called Hasman Gallery in particular, uh, had a whole series of, of uh, small focus shows, Bob uh, came down for some of those, and we reacquainted ourselves. So it was one of these nice personal experiences that um, as I say, crossed over into the profession. Uh, and it's, uh, one further word about Max. Uh, uh, he would say, I think he hated American art. Uh, <laughs> uh, he claims he had a wonderful time in my class, but I don't think he enjoyed it one year, as you know, uh, trained as a classist. So all this is by way of saying I'm, I was delighted and am delighted that he picked up the bait on the idea of doing an Indiana retrospective. Uh, this was uh, and is one of the major figures of the pop movement uh, who, for various reasons, has largely been overlooked or marginalized, part of his own doing as a kind of cranky, withdrawn, uh, isolated individual, part of his own doing, part changes in taste, partly, by contrast, the enormous energy and effort that has gone uh, into the promotion, say, of Warhol and Lichtenstein, their foundations, of course, are major operations. So for a variety of reasons, not least, of course, Indiana moving to Maine in the, in the late 70s, uh, where he's been uh, ever since, largely out of the mainstream. So, as I say, the moment seemed to be right, and uh, I'm all the more convinced, particularly having seen this installation, uh, how brilliant it is, uh, uh, and what it really proves uh, uh, is the monumentality and the power of Indiana's prints. Uh, he's one of those rare artists, certainly among his colleagues, I would argue, where uh, 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 his print output is as important uh, as his work in painting and sculpture. And that's saying a lot. Now, I do think it's an interesting phenomenon that um, uh, this whole generation, most of them, uh, have been very productive printmakers. I think it's one of the phenomena of, of the pop movement that somehow uh, the, the use of, of silk screen, uh, bold and bright colors, and especially large scale, the hard edge that is possibility with, with, with screen printing, all of these um, have involved these artists. Uh, and we think that, you know, that Lichtenstein is uh, not only a major painter, but a major printmaker. Warhol, probably even more so, and of course, Warhol's great contribution is that he blurred the line between painting and printmaking. Really, very innovative uh, technical advances took place with this generation. So it's in that context that we can now look at Indiana's prints in isolation. They're not, in a sense, dependent on the career 
as a whole. So what I thought I would do with, for you this evening uh, is in a way, uh, uh, to, to an extent, put uh, Indiana in some kind of context uh, uh, and the, print, the prints that you've seen or will see uh, in the larger context of the career as a whole, just to, uh, in a sense, bring, it, bring all these themes together. It's an interesting issue that I always sort of really sorted out as, as we began, Marty and I began to look comprehensively uh, at his uh, works on paper, uh, what the relationship was. Because in many cases, uh, the prints that you see uh, are directly derived from paintings that he made. But there are a number of paint, major paintings in his career uh, that he didn't make prints of. Uh, and I wondered why. Uh, Partly, I think, or the main reason, what my guess is, that when he was able, even from the early period, to sell a painting, uh, and uh, in a way he got his reputation going, when Alfred Barr bought the first American Dream in 1963, 64, from the Museum of Art, Modern Art, almost instantly gave Indiana uh, an important contemporary reputation. Uh, but, as I say, the, the number and selection of works that he's made prints uh, has been very variable. And most of it occurs to me is when he sold a painting, when it went to a, a collector abroad or in this country, when it went into a museum, it, would live, it was literally, of course, no longer in his possession. And that seemed to have prodded him, as it were, to make a print as a kind of aid memoir, a recollection, something that he could keep for his own collection. Uh, appears to be uh, the rationale. Well, I start with the, uh, some of the famous photographs of the 60s. Uh, I hardly need to rehearse the biography for most of you here. Born in Newcastle, uh, very much a part growing up in central uh, Indiana. Uh, as he himself has told the, the, the tale many times of moving around with his family, adopted. The, both parents married and remarried. So this is a very important unsettled quality uh, in his youth and childhood, uh, which um, he later claims, and I think there's a validity to it, uh, that it gave him the first ideas of sort of numerical sequence. The, the, the fact that his life really could be packaged as a series of numbers. In this case, uh, Exact number of something like moving 21 times in the first 20 years of his life. Uh, that sense of numerology uh, as a stand in, literally, for, uh, for his biography, which of course has taken on much more life, uh, that is to say, numbers, uh, in the, in, uh, uh, as his career uh, proceeded. So in the, in the, uh, uh, the, the, the 40s and 50s uh, have training in art school, is still kept in his position, possession. Many of his early drawings and watercolors uh, was favorably uh, viewed by his teachers here in Indiana. Uh, uh, goes away to the army, uh, returns to art school at uh, uh, Chicago, the Art Institute School, one of the major uh, uh, programs in what I would call sort of classical academic art training, where you learn drawing. As he himself uh, indicated, uh, uh, prodded him to study original works, especially the print collections. And, uh, uh, one needs to remember you know, the, the great art collections, the American collections, the print collections, which Indiana himself recalls working with during that important period of study. Whether that was the first impetus of an interest in self working on paper, uh, who's to say? Uh, but these are important formative years for this generation. Now, like many of his colleagues um, who ended up in New York, New York was the place to go. Not only was abstract expressionism the sort of the, the, the peak of its, I want to say, almost tyranny uh, of, uh, of formalism, nonetheless, it was the most exciting city in this country, if not the world at the time. The, the energy generated by abstract expressionism, the new sense of American uh, artistic power and influence internationally drew, of course, uh, many of these artists, the, the Abex artists themselves, but also, of course, the, the young artists interested in the new realism. Uh, a realism they took on for a variety of reasons, 
mostly as a way of challenging uh, this uh, overpowering presence and domination of abstract, uh, abstract painting. Uh, yes, uh, Lichtenstein, I think, was born in New York, and one or two others were very much East Coast artists. But the interesting thing about most of the pop group uh, is that they came from elsewhere. Oldenburg from Sweden to Chicago, uh, uh, Wesselman from, uh, 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 from Cincinnati, uh, Jim Dine, etc., all drawn to New York. And it must have been a fascinating moment to arrive. Warhol, of course, from Pittsburgh. Uh, all, these, all these figures coming together, uh, impoverished young aspiring artists, uh, many of them unable to afford uh, you know, materials, let alone workspace, gravitated, uh, as you see, to um, uh, this, uh, this uh, area down in Lower Manhattan on, on the uh, in, uh, uh, East River. Waterfront, uh, where the South Street uh, Seaport now is, uh, and Indiana's case in particular, County Slip. Uh, and there they found many abandoned warehouses from the 19th and even early 20th century, industrial production areas for the shipping industry, uh, etc. Manufacturing had been abandoned. Johns and Rauschenberg found many of their first. Um, sort of ephemeral objects of junk sculpt, junk materials that they began to incorporate into their combines. So too Indiana uh, takes a uh, studio down there. There is on the roof um, with many of the other uh, uh, friends and colleagues, Agnes Martin, Jack Youngerman. Uh, uh, none of them in the end, really, or then or later, really thought of themselves as a new school or a group, but they were in the same boat together. Uh, and they were able to use these, as I say, large empty spaces were perfect for studio production. It was Indiana's first exposure to the work of many of these colleagues. I'll touch on, uh, on that in a moment. The, the, the photograph on the left uh, is, of course, an early view of Indiana working with stencils. I, I picked that out because I want to stress the importance of, as it were, the edge, the silhouette, the sense and shape of lettering. Is something that interested me very early on. Now we know the famous transition coming to New York. Uh, he gives up his given name of Robert Clark, takes on the name of his native state. He becomes a new, as it were, a new artist, or takes on a new artistic identity. Something that has happened many times in the history of American uh, arts and letters. Mark Twain being, of course, uh, a major example. Walt Whitman was Walter Whitman. That uh, shortened nickname uh, became an important new identity in American uh, American literature of the 19th century. Mark Rothko, Arshiel Gorky come to mind as contemporary events. So it's not an unusual occurrence, but it is one clearly in terms of one's own psychology and autobiography uh, as a way of establishing, as I say, oneself in a new sort of way. All of this comes together now in Indiana's own uh, bio, early biography. At about the same moment, as I say, uh, artists like particularly Warhol, Lichtenstein, uh, and a few of the others were also moving towards uh, ways of finding uh, new kinds of realism to challenge abstract expressionism. As we know, this would soon be called pop art. Uh, at first, um, seemed to be highly offensive, uh, misunderstood, because, of course, even though it was a return to realism, and as you know, the, the dialogue between abstraction and realism was a long one in the history of the 20th century. It was now realism's turn, but instead of going back to whatever we call traditional realism, this comes out of the supermarket. It comes out of uh, uh, commercial imagery. In Indiana's case, the signage that we saw on the neighboring buildings, on the streets, uh, often worn and tattered uh, signage. The signage of, uh, of the street level itself, uh, being there in the East River, the East River Drive, and automobile traffic. But the river traffic itself also became sources of uh, inspiration, coal barges, railroad barges, and so forth, uh, going by, produced a kind of en a new energy uh, <coughs> that, um, in Indiana's case, he wanted to, uh, wanted to emulate. An early view of, uh, uh, of his uh, uh, 
studio. Uh, they are the left, this kind of clutter, this gathering of stuff, um, uh, flywheels and beams and posts, uh, and it largely been, been abandoned on the floors of these buildings. We know how uh, Rauschenberg at this time, I'd say the mid to late 50s, began to develop these famous combines. The same thing with Jasper Johns. Very interesting relation, I think, between uh, what they were doing and what Indiana would do with these so-called early urns, uh, these totems, sculptural totems, was also, as you see, made out of the, of the contemporary junk, as it were, uh, that he found uh, lying around and could be reassembled. And that is, of course, also uh, an important tradition of the 20th century, going back uh, to Dada, to Cubism, the idea of the found object, its transformation, as we know by Brock and Picasso, Dada surrealism, Dada particularly, uh, Duchamp, the idea of the found object taking on a new identity. Uh, was it certainly influential both for Liechtenstein, for Rauschenberg, for Johns. Less so, I think, one of the interesting things that sets Indiana apart uh, is the Americanness. That while Indiana is very ultimately very knowledgeable about, about the history of art, and modernism knows exactly where he fits. Uh, really uh, uh, kept his distance. He's not so much as grounded in uh, the history of Dada, of Cubism, Cubist collage. Uh, as his peers were. And so already there is a different course. Uh, some have even debated uh, to what extent he is a pure pop artist. Uh, we could go on debating that. Uh, there is no sort of central core. These artists all came together. They would often visit each other's openings. Uh, and so they knew what was going on, but were not really paying attention to one another's uh, studio. That's why it's all the remarkable that 1959, 1960, 61, in a very short period of time, they all almost spontaneously at the same time arrived at this new uh, kind of imagery. Uh, the, first, the very first exhibitions of the New York Stallion of Honey's Hat, of, of uh, Lincolnstein, Johns, Rauschenberg, uh, and Indiana himself making his first quote, uh, uh, pop images. Warhol moving at this moment, for example, from uh, a bit of cateringness in his work to the hard edge labels of the Campbell soup can. Uh, the fact that, it, that these are almost you know, simultaneous, I think is one of the most interesting phenomena uh, in, the, in the beginnings of, uh, of this group. So it is in that context that uh, uh, Indiana begins. I also just make a quick comparison uh, to, to um, uh, his herm uh, called Hole here, his play of materials, the fascination early on in Indiana's work between the verbal and the visual, the wonderful pun between the word hole and the arrows pointing to a literal hole uh, in uh, uh, the sculpture itself. But I juxtapose it with one of the pieces of wood sculpture done by <laughs> Louise Nevelson of an older generation who later became a friend of the Indianas, uh, who was also working in, and had herself moved to New York. And I think it's an interesting area for further explanation. Uh, 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 the interest in Indiana uh, with found pieces, particularly of wood, that he could reassemble and create a kind of new figure, a new figuration, uh, owes, I believe, something to. Uh, to Nevelson's, uh, Nevelson's presiding uh, uh, work at this time. Uh, we, we also can't move into this full period of the 60s without quickly mentioning Jack Youngerman, I've already mentioned the name, and of course Ellsworth Kelly, uh, his friend and, 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 and uh, companion uh, in these early years, uh, stylistically uh, uh, working in, in a very similar manner uh, as they were just on the threshold, as I say, this new sort of hard edge uh, definition of forms. Uh, younger than there, or younger than you will see, uh, there on the left, Indiana on the right, in one of his uh, first paintings he called The Sweet Mystery. Uh, this is a reference, uh, it's multiple references. The wonderful thing about Indiana is that uh, some of this is generated by. Uh, associations, uh, observations he was making at the time. In other cases, he's overlaid these 
paintings later with autobiographical statements of what he intended, as it, as it were, the paintings in Indiana's and imagery in Indiana's life uh, continues to, as it were, evolve and take on layers of meaning even after they're uh, completed. Uh, in the case here, uh, the image on the right, the sweet mystery, uh, where you can barely make out the letters uh, in blue or lavender, oh, I'm sorry, blue or lavender uh, in the center of the sweet mystery uh, is an indication that Indiana is wanting to assert uh, maintain lettering in his pictures. One of the major differences ultimately that separated him from both Youngerman uh, and, uh, uh, and Ellsworth Keller. But you can see how close uh, the, the sense of, uh, of, of like coloring, the primary colors. Uh, at, at the same time, for all the closeness, Youngerman's work there on the left still remains very much in the abstract expressionist tradition, whereas Indiana's painting, while it is an abstraction, is a kind of landscape of the new language of form. The ginkgo leaves of the ginkgo trees that surrounded it down there in that area of lower Manhattan. The diagonals of orange and black, or red and black, suggesting sidewalk crossing. Um, the suggestion of Chinatown, the, uh, the, the um, uh, uh, nuclear experimentation that was going on, the threats of the bomb. Uh, you could read these as, of course, multiplying cells, forms of explosion. All these were themes that swirl, were swirling around, and in a sense, uh, Indiana distills them into, as I say, a kind of, uh, for better, want of a better term, an abstract, nonetheless, an abstract landscape. Uh, likewise, the connection to uh, his friend Kelly's work. Kelly, of course, had gone to Paris in the 50s, but had begun to develop, particularly with photography, uh, uh, taking images of local architecture, uh, plant, vegetable forms, a major interest of, of Kelly's, uh, showing you one of the beautiful green uh, leaves, these, this series of watercolors uh, that he did about this uh, time. Again, abstracting the leaf, the plant, uh, into its essential form, as we know, later evolved into total uh, uh, abstract uh, uh, geometric uh, forms. But again, I think the juxtaposition is pretty obvious with Indiana on the right, and the play of the image of, of leaves with the word leaves um, underneath it. The same kind of palette. Uh, clearly, these were artists, as I say, there's a kind of visual dialogue going on uh, as they're finding their own voice. Indiana, Indiana himself has made a, uh, much of the, the separation from, uh, from his friend Kelly. Uh, that he claims Kelly never forgave him for continuing to maintain lettering and verbal in his work. Um, that, I think, eventually needs to be sorted out. Certainly, there was, uh, for all the closeness of style, uh, 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 the, the, the divergence of two different trajectories here uh, in their subsequent, the subsequent uh, career. Now, the word uh, Moy, I think, uh, Krauss has, has, has really brought this out in, uh, in the catalog and in the labels uh, that you see in the exhibition. We all knew that, uh, again, for simplification purposes, Indiana is on the one hand uh, an historian. Uh, and secondly, if not more, or primarily, uh, an autobiographer. Uh, and they come together. Uh, for his observations of the contemporary scene of historical events, whether they were pre political or otherwise, uh, ha has engaged him from the very beginning. The consciousness of family, the consciousness of self. And so, paintings with the titles of Terre Haute, the references to the railroad, to uh, the, uh, uh, Central America, to, to uh, Wabash, uh, to um, Eyeball on the Red Bull Manifest, uh, his grandfather working for the railroad, uh, the railroad culture. Uh, these, you, you can argue, even though they're sort of signature uh, pop images, uh, uh, very simplified signage and highway signs are, in effect, his first uh, self-portraits. They're visual pieces of autobiography. 
whether referencing, as I say, family members or place names uh, here uh, in Indiana. One of the great um, achievements, and this is not it's something I, I have been urging and I wish he would make, prints, mon two monumental pictures, a diptych that he did, this pair uh, called Mother is Mother, Father is a Father, a tribute to uh, his step-parents standing by the old uh, Tim Lizzie Ford there, uh, became a major exploration, uh, exploration as I say, of, of it, literally his artistic uh, beginnings, uh, his, uh, his, his biological be beginnings, although as we know that's very complicated. Uh, interesting, I think, just in form, he has the two circles side by side, again, that play of cellular I imagery. It's also kind of binocular imagery. To me, it's also suggestive of old picture albums, uh, grays of uh, 19th century daguerreotypes, and so forth. But it's also an image, uh, I've never really discussed it explicitly with him, uh, that is indebted uh, to major examples that he certainly knew of um, great pa paintings by American predecessors uh, of either families or parents. Uh, the one on the left is in the Whitney Museum, he certainly knew. Arshiel Gorky's self-portrait as a young boy with his mother shortly after they emigrated uh, to the United States became, I think, for Indiana, a major precedent in the idea of painting one's parent, and particularly the mother. Uh, Indiana was very close to his mother, uh, comes out in many ways, as, uh, as, we, as we shall see. But there's not only that, there's, of course, the most famous painting of a, of a mother in our history, uh, Louvre, to be sure, but replicated all the time, and Whistler's mother there on the left, but another painting of a prominent artist's father that Indiana would have known in the Metropolitan Museum. And these artists, they all went to the Met. They went to Marmar. They went to the Whitney and saw uh, uh, exhibitions and work from the permanent collection. So I'd like to think that the portrait on the right of Tom, by Thomas Aikens of his father, Benjamin Aikens, as a calligrapher in 1880, a very powerful, spotlit portrait uh, would have been another, as it were, parental image uh, that fathered uh, his own mother and father. So it's a very, in, the, in these early years of the 60s, once he finds this style, uh, he's moving almost immediately, as I say, to paintings of place, and paintings, if not of self, certainly of family. There is, however, another major development uh, that I think is one of the richest and most interesting that broadens, in a sense, Indiana's, in a way, definition of himself as an American artist. He declared not only when, when he took on the name Indiana, he said, I'm an American painter of signs. American painter of signs. By that, it's not just, um, it seems to me, the visual. He discovered, of course, in Lower Manhattan and County Slip, looking out on the East River with boats coming and going, the highway, the river highway, that this was the great territory of, of among the most famous American artists and writers of the mid-19th century, what we now call the American Renaissance. And of the American Renaissance, those who were supposed to Boston, Emerson Thoreau in New York, was Herman Melville and Walt Whitman, the two giants of American literature uh, in the 1850s and 1860s. And so now began a series of remarkable large canvases, ones that have been held either by the estate or by the himself, uh, or by the Morgan Art Foundation supporting Indiana. Uh, these have never been made into, into, into prints directly. Uh, on the left, um, the Great Eastern with a series of lines within the concentric circles uh, that are taken from the Whitman poem about the Great Eastern, a great sailing vessel going up the, uh, the East River, again a reference uh, uh, to these early heroes. But a way we now realize that Robert Indiana was placing himself in the heritage of a great American tradition. He would be an artist worthy of, if not equal to, those of the American Renaissance. 
Uh, it, it also was a reflection of his natural interest in literature, widely read, has written poetry itself, integrated, as we know, it's from the beginning, words, letters, uh, set, even sentences, phrases, uh, dominate his art. That balance between the, liter the literary and the purely optical or visual is one of the most beautiful balances uh, in, that again distinguishes his style uh, in, uh, in, in modern 20th century, 21st century art. And so, as I say, the referencing to Whitman and on the right, the so-called Melville triptych, where you see Corey Slit, uh, Corey Slit, Corey Slit, Whitehall, these are references to sequential piers uh, uh, along the, the waterfront. Uh, but the circles, uh, the referencing to, uh, you know, this is your insular city of the Manhattans, circumambulate the city. Uh, I think many of us would recognize, recognize those words coming from the marvelous opening paragraph that begins famously, Call Me Ishmael, that describes the, the narrator of Moby Dick, Ishmael, going to, from the, the island of Manhattan, Manhattan, down to the waterfront. And of course, as we know, the voyage of Moby Dick begins at the waterfront. The second chapter takes us to Nantucket, and then finally on out to the Atlantic, around South America, and into the Great Pacific. Uh, so the Moby Dick is a history in the way of contemporary America. It's global. Certainly the idea of circumambulation in the play, I won't get into it, uh, of seas and essence, circumambulate, the referencing to insular and, and isolation and islands. Uh, and even the uh, arrow form suggesting a pier thrusting out into the water. Uh, and on the right, of course, the, the, the straight line itself, uh, uh, suggesting perhaps a, a ship's mast uh, that um, uh, Ishmael saw on the waterfront. And then the curious design, the, the, uh, the tripartite design for the middle circle. Uh, uh, we know it came, it, it came from a number of sources. Indiana had been to, to the Museum of Modern Art and made a drawing in his journal, in his sketchbook, of Brancusi's torso, which is a sleek uh, brass column with two legs coming out. At the same time, we also recognize its relation to the first peace signs, uh, Bertrand Russell and the peace protests of the 60s. I also like to think of it as a referencing to, of course, New York transportation then and now, and when I say now, the New York City subway token. But I'm also thinking, of course, of the circle line cruises. This is what Indiana, in a way, began to do in these, on the one hand, the paradox of, of great simplicity and yet enormous layerings of complexity. So the Melville triptych, of course, is a painting of great richness that refers both to uh, the past and to his own, as it were, uh, American heritage, uh, as well as uh, thinking about the present. And it led him into a wider exploration, uh, part of this early grouping, of what we now call the early American modernists, the sort of first American abstraction uh, in the Stiegert circle. And Indiana really was one of the few artists or writers or American critics to become interested in promoting these artists. I and mean, he borrows the inspiration, of course, from uh, Joseph Stella, uh, the great night scene with the Brooklyn Bridge, an inspiration for his own Brooklyn Bridge imagery, and then perhaps the most famous image of all, uh, the series that he thought of as his greatest works, I'd say Indiana, the figure five, a reference to the image uh, uh, here, on the left, the, I saw the figure five in gold, which of course was not only uh, a reference to the Charles Demuth painting on the left, which hangs in the map, uh, but Demuth himself in 1928 paying homage to his colleague and friend, um, uh, uh, William Carlos Williams, the poem, poet who had written, had jotted down these lines of poem, poetry uh, in a notebook on a rainy night, uh, walking in Lower Manhattan to the studio of Marsden Hartley. So uh, in, in this picture that Indiana does as a kind of homage to Demoth, 
in turn opens up once again uh, to these foundational sources of many uh, in, in individuals in the Stevens, certain Stevens himself, Demons, as I say, William Carlos Williams, writing, writing modernist poetry, uh, and as I say, on the way to Hartley Studio, who had become a figure very importantly in uh, uh, Indiana's own uh, later work. And of course, there are differences. When you know, I show these images to students, and when you see them for the first time, you say, well, they look like the same thing, or uh, you know, identical in scale. In fact, they're quite different. Uh, and again, Indiana is very subtle about this. They're not just replications of an earlier word. They're homages. Uh, and uh, there's, a, first of all, a major difference in scale. The, the Demoth is a typical easel painting, uh, you know, two by three feet, three by four feet. The Indiana uh, is mural scale, is um, billboard scale. Uh, it's also, while it takes on something of the cubist fragmentation, of the sort of futurist replication of the fives, of a, seeing a fire engine go by on the street, Indiana flattens it out in this new hard edge, as I say, modern style. Uh, it becomes a new play on fives, not so much now that the uh, fire engine going by on a rainy night, uh, but he introduces now for the first time uh, these very simplified uh, phrases or words, uh, not written in sentences, not written in Melville's paragraph, but as you see, er, uh, uh, die, eat, hug, USA. This kind of reductive language of the modern American scene of fast foods, fast cars, fast sex, whatever it might be. This reductiveness now uh, to uh, uh, you know, you know, not a, not a long literary statement, but these kind of punchy references and the essence of contemporary life that reference hug uh, intimacy uh, juxtaposed to die. The sudden you know, sort of highway crash suggested, uh, er and eat, uh, these plays on sort of basic American experience, which as we know would play out later in his career with love and art, and some of it again very simplified word treatments. Uh, moving in as fast as I can here, to introduce, of course, again, by the mid to later 60s, some of his first, I would call, polemical pictures, uh, very much uh, uh, you know, political, very much aware of contemporary history. The referencing to the peace movement, Yield Brother, uh, and the peace sign that appears in variations of the diamond painting uh, there on the left. Indiana paying very much attention to the turbulence of the 60s. Again, an interesting aspect of pop is not only uh, its artistic revolution, but of course its embrace, its challenge, uh, its engagement with the revolutions of the 60s, whether it's the Vietnam War, race relations, and so forth. In terms of the latter, of course, uh, with his series, of which you have one example here in Mississippi. Uh, part of the so-called Confederacy series. His intention was to paint uh, a dozen uh, uh, of these paintings in the same format with the state profile in the center and then isolate in, in the center of uh, the state the one city uh, that had had a, a terrible racial violence, um, uh, whether it be Selma, Alabama, uh, you know, here in Mississippi, as I say, ended up doing, I guess, the Georgia and Florida, uh, and then didn't complete the rest of uh, the series. Somehow, I think, just ran out of steam, felt that it might have been too many. But as a group of four pictures, which were hung for the first time together since he painted them in the Whitney show last fall, uh, again, was, as I say, this first exploration of, uh, for him, statement of his views on contemporary politics uh, and, uh, and society. What is a bit washed out of the painting, I just would highlight, is that the central outline of the state in each one of these paintings is a bright pink. So as one reads the phrasing, just as in the anatomy uh, of a nation, the high, uh, uh, every, uh, every nation which ha must have its hind part, ironically, by the time you get through the sentence, you are in the pink hind part, the rear end uh, of, of, of the state. 
question. Very powerful and yet beautiful pictures. Uh, following that, and as I say, running side by side, now he's developed his vocabulary. Another seminal work, the key one there on the left, the, the, the American Dream. Uh, this was the second, the first, uh, uh, maybe the year before, but this one was acquired by Alfred Barr from the Museum of Modern, Modern Art. That was instantly establishes and give, gives Indiana major uh, reputation and credibility now among his peers, begins to be included in uh, the, the, the top exhibitions over the next uh, few years. The American Dietary, of course, a play on Eat, Die, Love, Er, Hug, we've seen that. The referencing to pinball machines, to slot machines, uh, to the highway, uh, led to this famous commission he was, he was given by Philip Johnson in 1964 for the New York World's Fair. Now, he had begun, uh, as I say, to do paintings, and as you can see, Several of these now begin to be translated into prints. The, the American Dream, the Eat Dogs, this in, in various versions. Uh, but it would be the World's Fair Commission for the New York uh, State Pavilion, uh, which Johnson had, Philip Johnson had designed himself, an early and important collector of, of this generation, uh, and uh, 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 invited a number of these young artists to, to, to produce works to go around the cylinder of the pavilion, this concrete uh, cylinder that had exhibitions of American art you know, in, its, in its interior. Uh, and Indiana was flanked by Warhol, Major Lichtenstein, a, uh, Ellsworth Kelly, uh, a group, as I say, of these from now familiar colleagues. Indiana chose um, uh, to, to experiment again with something that is graphic, it's, it's a painting, it's a print, uh, it's of course a high relief sculpture. That is to say, the, um, uh, the, the, the five uh, uh, piece uh, on each side that you have here uh, with these large uh, metal letters uh, that are, that are uh, dotted with light bulbs and on opening day were illuminated. Robert Moses, the great art czar, as we know, of New York and Central Park and the Development of the city and the sort of uh, godfather of the New York World's Fair itself uh, uh, immediately objected. Uh, he objected to Warhol's work, really more understandably, because Warhol, almost as a kind of taunt, painted the uh, America's ten most wanted criminals. Uh, it was no, no surprise that uh, Moses would have found that offensive. But uh, in Vienna, he came by and said, "The light bulbs have to go off." I can't be illuminated uh, 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 because he said people will think they're good, that this is a restaurant and not a, not a museum. Uh, so it's the first kind of conflict with society, uh, with, uh, with, with one's peers, became uh, uh, again a new avenue of development uh, as Indiana later uh, produced a number of works of, of single letters, including love, uh, in um, uh, illuminated light bulbs. Uh, this wonderful kind of uh, uh, third dimensional quality, uh, fourth dimensional quality. Uh, there follows, uh, uh, later in 64, the famous commission from the Museum of Modern Art to do a design of a Christmas card. And it was the first look. He, now, he'd actually done love in, in four blocks with four stars underneath. Uh, so there was already a kind of play between the quadrangle or the square, as it were, and four letters. But this particular commission, I think, gave him now the opportunity to consolidate in just the word itself. And these basic uh, primary colors, which he himself claimed had come from the blue of the Indiana sky, uh, he said uh, the red and green of the Phillips 66, which were not red and green, but that doesn't matter. Uh, they, were, they were, of course, also Christmas colors. In any case, whatever the derivation, the referencing then and since, it became, as you probably know, the, in a way, the most famous thing he ever produced. Certainly, from that moment on, it has been uh, the largest selling Christmas card or, or note card that MoMA has ever had. We know the irony, the great irony, the central irony of Indiana's career, uh, the way this initiated, 
he never took out the copyright on these early loves, and so one of the reasons they have been so ripped off, so replicated, uh, so many times reproduced, uh, is because of, since they were instantly in the public domain. I think he himself has been a bit ambivalent about it. He rather likes the idea of being, in a way, the most popular artist in the world with the largest number of images. And it is probably the most famous single word of our century. I mean, everybody recognizes it. Just as famous as, say, the Coca-Cola logo. On the other hand, has made no money in royalties uh, from, its, uh, uh, from its reproduction. That since was corrected later in, career, in his career when he began to convert love into sculptures. Uh, uh, there was copyright. Uh, yet another wonderful variation of which there is a print, uh, the, the Metamorphosis of Norma Jean Mortensen. Oh, I'm sorry. The uh, Norma Jean Mortensen on the right. Uh, in which there's this marvelous play of lettering in the two circles, Norma Jean Mortensen in the outer circle, Marilyn Monroe in the inner circle, uh, two and six, six and two, reference numbers now here again coming together with words, uh, numbers that refer to the birth and death dates of Marilyn Monroe, uh, but also the number of letters added and subtracted to get from one of them and the other, there's, of course, also the play on the dial telephone that Marilyn was supposedly clutching when she died. I also like to think it's a play on Marilyn's first, uh, referencing the Marilyn's first husband. Uh, 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 the baseball player, the diamond, uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the idea of the home run. Uh, it, is a, it is actually the central pinup figure. Uh, he was enormously pleased, uh, came from a pinup calendar he picked up uh, on a visit back to, to uh, Indiana uh, and turned it over and, and found the word printed in Indiana. Uh, so it again has layers of meaning that reference uh, famous celebrities, uh, celebrity imagery uh, at this time, uh, but also something deeply, uh, deeply personal. The Kelly influence, I like to think, or at least the Kelly dialogue, continues interestingly throughout this whole period. And I'll show you his first major numerical sequence exhibited, as I recall, the Montreal Exposition of 1967. This was exploding numbers, in which he plays with the geometry of the ever uh, enlarged numbers uh, moving from left to right. This was hung incorrectly. Indiana wanted them hung on the same median level. So that the two, for example, if you think of that slightly higher, the rounded edge of the two on the right side and the bottom would nestle against and be in dialogue with the three that follow. In other words, a visual connection, not just on side by side. But to me, they, they, this makes a very interesting play, even though they have parted ways, uh, both in terms of friendship, uh, but also artistically, uh, Ellsworth Kelly doing some of his fragmented are those numbers there on the left? They're certainly very close, uh, although more abstract. So I just bring this uh, kind of dialogue that has also been part of the uh, Indiana biography. And it landed, as I, as I said, I, I remember this incident uh, when I was uh, at Dartmouth and uh, got to know Indiana for the first time. The chair of the visual arts program is an inveterate collector of ephemera American antiques and objects, prints, uh, wood stuff, all kinds of, of things, uh, filled his office. And Indiana, who expressed an interest in numbers, uh, this, this uh, professor named Matthew Waisaki said, well, you really should do the voyage of life. That's what this represents. And he gave Indiana uh, a Courier Knives print, it was a reproduction of it in, in your exhibition, uh, uh, of a kind of stepped bridge, an arched bridge, in which a baby is crawling out of the first step, then goes through various stages of growth, and an old man is descending on the right-hand side. So it goes through, and it, and it was titled, The Stages of Man. There was a companion print, The Stages of Woman. This was very much on the mind of 19th century American artists, the whole idea of the evolution, uh, the notion of youth and age. 
particularly as America approached the, the, uh, the centennial, that it was not only a nation of youth, again, think of the new tradition of Mark Twain, and the celebration of boyhood, but also the consciousness that by the nation's centenary, uh, uh, and of course this then has a new set of meanings with the bicentennial, but particularly in the 19th century, that America was also one of the oldest of, of, of states, oldest surviving government in our democracy. So age of youth and the sense of perpetuation, uh, of replication, of, of, of going on indefinitely, uh, at least in human terms and social terms, is a major theme uh, uh, caught in that Courier of Knives print. And so I'll just juxtapose as we quickly go through the numbers, uh, because as we realize now, Indiana's choice of colors uh, is very much meant to allude to changes in, as it were, the aging process. From the bright intense as you have, as you have here, uh, of number one, a strong juxtaposition of the complementary reds and greens, the vibration of that intense blue and orange, variations on complementary colors, whether the green suggesting the fertility of birth, the red the bursting of blood, the blue the uh, uh, opening of the sky, and I juxtapose it to another one of these major paintings of the 19th century by J.G. Brown, uh, in fact called The Ages of Man. They're in a picnic in the woods, you can't quite make out, but a picnic in the woods are uh, children, uh, there's a young couple, a married couple, I think on the left, uh, 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 the grandparents as it were, uh, quite conscious referencing, as I say, to the very stages of life. So uh, this became, I think, becomes a major inspiration uh, in Indiana's work. Number two, famously, uh, this wonderfully intense play on um, springtime colors. And here I'm showing you Thomas Cole's series that begins, uh, it's called the, literally The Voyage of Light, a series of four great canvases, uh, the, the first of which was, uh, uh, was uh, uh, youth, no, childhood, where the, the, the babe is, is being led by uh, the angel coming out of the sort of the, the, the earth itself in, in the spring light. Uh, Thomas Cole would paint in the series early spring light, early daylight, uh, and as the series went on, the seasons changed as did the time of day. So then there was this cyclical sensibility in a more narrative sense in the 19th century version but as we go through Indiana, the colors become, in a way, more jarring, more intense. Uh, and here is Cole's painting of youth, as he's set free by the angel uh, to, to his aspirations. And, and, and those <coughs> very strong green colors in the opening picture now move towards the brightness of uh, sort of mid-morning, late morning. <coughs> and as, of course, you can imagine <coughs> uh, with Indiana now, four and five as we get to the middle of the series, uh, take on a kind of intensity, uh, a kind of visual maturity, uh, these, these contrasts, whereas by the time we get to the second half of the sequencing, six and seven begin to be a little more jarring, particularly seven with its introduction of orange against the blue there. Um, the, the intensity of six with something of the earlier greens, with something of the conflicts that will come. Uh, number eight, uh, in Indiana, one of the most important in his career, I uh, juxtaposed with uh, the third in the Cole series, Manhood, where the figure now uh, is in turbulent waters of, of older age, rushing now down through the rapids, uh, the angel there uh, in the distant heaven, and then finally, Number nine, uh, <clears throat> where we now get into his uh, conscious use of yellow, uh, coming from, as he said, the warning signs of the highway, particularly the yield sign. So the abstraction of yellow and nine and white is something very jarring, as I say, very strident, strident, but of course the introduction, the powerful introduction of black uh, is itself a kind of hint of mortality. And there's another kind of part of the series, this series of individual 
uh, stages of life, looking at old age there on the left. Uh, and that the series intentionally concludes with zero. Now I say intentionally concludes because this is, you know, one needs to think about this, this is different from our usual way, at least in the Western world, of numeration. We're trained uh, to, to do our numbers from zero to, to, to nine, and then go to uh, ten. Indiana chooses to place the zero at the end of the cycle, and I think that serves an important purpose. On the one hand, he can paint, as you see, zero uh, as an O, uh, oblivion, uh, omega, uh, what, ha what have you. But of course, it is also in these grays, not the pure black, but uh, uh, dark grays, light grays, whites, monochromes, that suggest, indeed, uh, there is the last of the coal series, uh, the, the, almost the spiritual world uh, of the angel now delivering the figure back into the heavens in this black and white drama. Uh, so the zero serves as the purpose of the end of life, as it were, on, on one level, but cleverly it also uh, keeps these as single digits, so you could begin again, whereas if he had begun the series with, with, uh, with zero, the tenth of the series would have to be a ten. Uh, this implies that once you reach zero, you go back over and over again, the cycle, continues to repeat itself. Something fascinating both to these 19th century predecessors and to Indiana himself. Well, in later career, I'll move into just a, uh, what we're familiar with, uh, is of course uh, uh, in the <coughs> 70s and 80s that the interest in not only translating onto a larger scale, but also three-dimensionality. And the decision in the number series to, to, to manufacture these uh, various sizes, but particularly the six-foot size, which your series here is one of the most important. Um, here I'm showing you from the series we showed uh, several years ago on Park Avenue in New York, a uh, wonderful period of time of year uh, where they were shown, you know, it was still winter time, it was up for about a month, and the spring flowers came along Park Avenue. And seeing these numbers from, I think it was uh, 59th Street to 69th Street, appropriately, uh, how they were transformed in nature was fascinating. But also his decision in the sculpture I, I just draw attention to, the fact that they're not full cubes, that um, the depth of the, of the numbers is only half, of course, of their width and height. And that was a strategic decision, <coughs> which I think worked beautifully because it maintains the graphic sense of a two-dimensional uh, number or letter, same thing with love and art that would follow, <coughs> at the same time that they become three-dimensional pieces of sculpture. So, <coughs> it's a very interesting play here, as I say, <coughs> excuse me, between the two and the three-dimensional. And it led, as we know, <coughs> to the translation of love, which we've seen many, many times uh, in the various uh, versions, both painted and in quartet steel. Uh, the art version there on the left, also various versions, usually in red and blue, uh, which are preoccupied and really uh, almost to the present day. But I want to conclude, uh, almost we conclude, with the, the great magisterial series that ends your exhibition. And this is the triumph, it seems to me, of the so-called heart analogies. Uh, the triumph uh, of uh, Indiana's, uh, his later career, the second half of the career set in Maine, uh, the discovery of those extraordinary coincidences that become, have become so much a part of his art. In this case, uh, buying the Masonic Lodge, the Star of Hope at Stars, which was one of his favorite subjects, Hope, which becomes <coughs> one of his more recent words of interest relating <coughs> both to Obama but also uh, to a new generation of possibility. Uh, and discovering in all of this that, that uh, Morriston Hart, this artist he'd been interested in many decades before and shared so much in his own life, his own art, uh, even be a demon for his own works. 
uh, a tortured artist, an uh, artist who moved around a lot, who'd gone to Berlin, mainly partly, at the outbreak of World War I, uh, and painted uh, his, his uh, uh, elegy uh, called Portrait of a German Officer. Partly been enamored of a German officer named Karl von Freiburg, uh, who was killed in the first months of the war, and Hartley did this powerful painting there on the left, which hangs in the Met. As it happens today, it's in the same gallery as the Dima Figure 5, creating a wonderful visual dialogue of uh, Indiana's, uh, let's say, artistic uh, parents. And it led him to the challenge, well, it, what he realized that Hartley had been on Vinyl Haven for the summer, uh, sometime in the uh, 20s or 30s, towards the end of Hartley's career, he'd come back to Maine, was a Maine artist, but Hartley had lived in a house diagonally across the street. And so there was this triggering, as it were, of a new relation with somebody he'd admired all along, <coughs> and led him to work on <coughs> the, what really is the most ambitious <coughs> series of his entire career. <coughs> The, uh, uh, the, the paintings uh, go on for about two dozen. The prints, he decided just to do ten. You have one of the rare, last complete sets of, uh, of, of the Harvey Elegy prints. Again, there's a distinction. The one on the right is, of course, the, uh, the Indiana painting, uh, larger in scale. And even though it follows the color scheme of the Hartley original, Hartley's work you can still see painterliness, the brushwork, the stroke, uh, the greatest sense of cubism, fragmentation, vibration. Uh, there is that flattening out, there is that hard edge, there is that mechanization, while at the same time retaining uh, the dedication to, uh, to Marsden Hartley. Uh, the first is a direct, as it were, a direct um, uh, homage. The next in the series, quite I'm not going to show them all, and you can go look at them. Uh, but I find interesting that the first var real variation he makes in his LG uh, is, as it were, an American variation, reducing it to the red, white, and blue of uh, the USA colors. Yet the next version is the German version, the colors of uh, the German national flag. Uh, black, yellow, uh, and reds, as you, as you can see. And it gave him an opportunity as well to experiment further with particularly the lower sections of these, uh, what had begun for Hartley at least as a torso, a torso seen in flags and uniform, but a vertical uh, a composition uh, that suggested head and torso only in that sense of referencing the idea of portrait. And that's why Demuth called them and called his own series poster portraits. But in Indiana's case, as we see moving into these later versions, uh, the signage begins to change in the, in the, uh, the lower sections. And the, then the next step in the middle of the series was to move towards the diamond configurations, of which there are four or six, again, or, you know, five, I guess. Uh, and then, as I say, he went on in terms of painting, but found it too challenging to do as a print uh, a, a series of tondos, one of which you see there on the left, where the original has really been transformed, while the German cross, the, the numbers, the, the, the words, the letters, refer to, to Maine, to von Freiburg, one has it been ein Berliner, to Kennedy in Berlin, to Hartley in Berlin, wonderfully complicated, rich pictures. These, as I say, are among the most ambitious, uh, and I use the adjective, magisterial achievements uh, of, of, of his career. Uh, and the great thing is, and what's so clear in this exhibition, is that the prints give you that experience equal to the paintings. As I say, that's a rare thing. In some ways, uh, 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 you would say that this was the high point of <coughs> Indiana's mature career. There have been sequences of, of, of interesting and quite beautiful works that have followed. I think only <coughs> time will tell how significant or how good they, they are or were. And by that I mean, in one sense, as he returns 
to the peace imagery now in, in the language of protest of our time as opposed to the 1960s, there is a retrospective er, uh, air. These were paintings, the peace paintings, done uh, in protest against President Bush's uh, uh, invasion of, of Iraq and later Afghanistan. Uh, and again, the polemical side of Indiana has come out uh, as were in its own forms of protest. But as you can see, the, the, the peace sign is, is pretty obvious here. Uh, they also look like rocket forms. And, and, and in the consciousness, my point being the consciousness of going back to the Bertrand Russell imagery of the 60s is this kind of retrospective rumination. Now, it happens to many artists in old age. It's interesting that even though Warhol's life was cut short by the gallbladder uh, 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 poisoning, uh, that he was already in a stage in the late 80s of going back and redoing Campbell's Soup in Maryland. And many of the famous images, the Statue of Liberty, etc., that dated from the 60s. Interestingly, Liechtenstein quite remarkably maintained the originality of his, of his pop uh, uh, cartoon style, but also his last works go back and redo the bathing figures, go back and redo uh, some of the, there's this, I say, this kind of summary synthesis uh, of reviewing one's own career. And so to me, the last beautiful pictures that uh, Indiana painted, not surprisingly, returned to the great American dream, which he had done periodically, uh, one, and he knew would go no further than nine. Uh, and uh, these were among the largest pictures of the series, one of the familiar diamond forms, one of the geometries always loved along with the circle, though perhaps those two the most important geometric designs that he's loved to work with. And of course, the diamond is a square turned on its side, uh, worked here in combination. The eighth is the largest and the only one, not surprisingly, that he's held on to. And we know that that was important. He said many, many times, explored eight, because, as he said, when he came back from the army, his mother was dying, uh, and on her deathbed, the one thing, the first thing she said to him was, would you like something to eat? And he began to play, as, you, as we have seen all along, with the word eat. But of course, it didn't take him long to realize that the passive tense of eat is eight, A-T, E, or E-I-G-H-T. Then there is the coincidence that his mother died in August, the eighth month of the year. So the lavender, the memorial quality, uh, and again, going back and referencing early places, August is a bittersweet. So this is again a kind of larger self-portrait, a kind of history painting, and then the triumphant nine painting, uh, where he's able to include nine nines, a wonderful pun, and as we begin to explore the circles, surrounding with, as I say, a, re a retrospective of almost all the major names, places, associations with his lifetime, with those of, of Hartley's, uh, of others who've been associated with Maine. And so so uh, at least until recent years, here is an artist who's been able to I think my concluding point would be to remain wonderfully inventive, but there's also a kind, as I say, of poignance of pushing himself, and we certainly see it with the more recent loves, the hopes, that he's just been producing too many of them. It's almost, and, and you could argue this is true a little bit of Klaus Oldenburg, a kind of replica, almost a self-parody of self-repetition. As I say, that intellectual question and stylistic one, uh, we'll have to wait until in the end uh, we have long gone and a generation can really sort out uh, what he has been doing in these recent years. But for, you know, whatever it is, six, seven decades, has been one of the most productive, original, uh, and interesting artists of this whole group. And I think now's the time for a look at the originals. Thank you very much. <laughs>